Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody out there today. A very warm welcome to you. My name is Michelle Moore. I'm a leadership consultant, coach and equality campaigner. Uh, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome you to this special conversation today to celebrate the publication of Loud Black Girls, edited and curated by the authors of the highly acclaimed and groundbreaking Slay in Your Lane, Yomi Adijoke and Elizabeth Uvabene. So Loud Black Girls is a powerful anthology, a collection of 20 essays exploring the richness and the variety of what it means to be a black woman in the UK today during these politically turbulent times. And today I'm joined by some incredible essayists and writers and filmmakers and creatives who I'm gonna tell you about shortly. The foreword for this book is written by none other than the Booker Prize winner, Bernadine Evaristo. Her words at the start of the book, I think set the tone perfectly for the context of this special conversation. We black British women are minoritized in Britain in the 21st century on account of our skin color and gender primarily. But Loud Black Girls shows that we are fighting back through the power of essays that recontextualize the hegemonic structures of Britain simply by positioning black women at the center of public discourse and therefore transforming the conversations. So today we are gonna have a great conversation with the writers Jandela Benson, Cuba Shand Baptiste and Paula Akpan. I would invite all of you watching to go online to use the hashtag loud black girls and to start posting about this incredible conversation. So without further ado, I'm going to make the introductions to our brilliant panel today and, and talk about their amazing talents. Cuba Shand Baptiste is a commissioning editor and columnist on the Independent Voices Desks. She typically covers news stories, politics, pop culture and social justice and has written for the website since 2016. She's also written features news and op opinion articles for The Guardian, Black Metro, Black, Black Ballad, Metro, Vice, Self.com, Gaudem, Stylist, Lady Beer, Days, The FT Advisor and more. Her essay from Loud Black Girls, Eating Britain's Racism, was recently ext extracted by Vogue.co.uk. Cuba is also one of those rare talents who has an amazing array of incredible friends. I'm going to let her tell us about that during this conversation. Jandela Benson is a British Nigerian writer, author of Young Motherhood, a photographer and filmmaker, and the contributing editor at Black Ballad the award-winning digital platform for black British women. She has written for the Metro Online, Independent Voices, MTV UK and Media Diversified. And her, her short story, Kindling, was published in the Book of Birmingham. Her visual work has featured in The Guardian, The Metro and The Voice and has, has it been exhibited across the UK and internationally. Paula Akpan is a journalist, historian and public speaker, a sociology graduate from the University of Nottingham. Her work mainly focuses on blackness, queerness and social politics. She regularly writes for a variety of publications, including Vogue, Teen Vogue, The Independent, Stylist, Vice, ID, Bustle, Time Out London and many more. She's a published essayist and you're going to hear about her essay in this book and an author of the black british lesbian and their relationship within the uk black women's movement for the forthcoming queer bible anthology which is out on june 10th 2021 published by harper collins check that out paula currently is in a fully funded master's student at goldsmith studying black british history with an interest in mapping out the lives and the activism of black british lesbians and queer women during the 70s and 80s these women are fire. They are amazing. We are very lucky to have them with us today. And we're going to dive into our conversations and get started. So just to give us to give everybody a bit of a flavour of your essays, I'd like us to just start with giving a, a very brief overview of the essays. So Jen, if you could start um, when, you know, when Elizabeth and Yomi came and asked you to, to kind of contribute to the anthology. Um, how did you decide on your subject and why did you decide that that was important to write about? 
Um, the idea came pretty immediately, to be honest, because I've been thinking a lot about um, what people have called the, I guess, the black girl renaissance online and just the way that um, black women are kind of very vocal. They're very um, active. They are bringing awareness to issues. They're sharing their work. They're gaining profile. And um, I've been thinking that someone needs to write something about that. Um, my essay, I, I don't want to say it's a history of that, but from a personal perspective, it's like a coming of age on the internet. So kind of that renaissance from my perspective as someone who literally grew up online. So that's how it kind of came immediately. Can you tell us the title of your essay and why you chose that title? Um, it's called Respect on Our Name from Other, oh my gosh, from Other to Iconic and Beyond. And um, Respect on Our Name is a play on a, a popular meme. <laughs> it's meme culture um, from a rapper in the um, US. And it's basically just that we deserve respect as black women. Like people should put respect on our names because we have done so much, especially in this kind of like digital culture. And I really wanted to kind of map my feelings as a young black girl feeling completely othered through to kind of like a young woman online and then now as a older young woman <laughs> still online and just yeah I just wanted to map my feelings and what I've seen and witnessed and kind of been a part of. Thank you and Paula for you did, was it you know straight away you decided yeah I've got to be in this this anthology this is going to be great and give us the title of your essay and a flavour of what you've written about. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when Yomi's email popped through, I was like, on it, don't worry about it. I'm there. Got you guys. Um, but it did take me a while to think about what I wanted to write. Um, I'd been considering maybe talking about queerness and being a black queer woman. But um, I think something that had been weighing on my mind a lot at the time was thinking about our visibility and how we interact with brands and organizations. And as you ascend with that visibility, then what does it mean for your work, especially if it's got a community focus? And I think the piece just asks a lot of questions and I have zero answers. And that's why it's called the quandary of securing the bag. I, yeah, I just kind of put out some, some questions and I'm hoping someone who reads it will email me with some thoughts because truly, we're just, we're out here, we're suffering. So <laughs> I think your essay really kind of brings out the questions, but it also does offer some alternative solutions in, in the kind of things that you are saying, but also that what you're not saying in between the lines, it really does. So Paula, it's, it's a great essay. And finally, last but no means by least. So Cuba, why did you choose to get involved? And what was it about the invitation that said to you, I have to have my essay as a part of this anthology. And what's the title of your essay? Um, so the, I'll start with the title. The title is Eating Britain's Racism. And um, I guess when I, when I heard from Yomi, it was kind of similar sort of response was just like, oh my, I want to be a part of this <laughs> immediately. And then the first thing that came to mind pretty much was this idea. I thought it was a, a strange idea because I wasn't really sure how to articulate sort of looking at the politics of racism and food and classism and all that stuff um but it's the sort of thing that I think about all the time because I'm basing it on my own personal experiences of sort of dealing with which is why I called it in eating Britain's racism um consuming the food from like my culture while also sort of taking in these messages about it and then looking at how that impacted me when I was quite young and later then came to embrace that food again. And I just really wanted to examine the timings of that, how old I was at each point, uh, who was in government, what public health responses were to this sort of thing. And then, yeah, and that was sort of, just hit the table, sorry. <laughs> that was sort of what I wanted to explore, yeah. Well, it was, it was such a powerful essay in so many ways, and I know we're gonna get into it, but I just wanna commend you in terms of how evocative it was, because I was just reflecting on the way in which you described some of the cuisine and how, you know, I was thinking about my own Guyanese history and ancestry and being brought up around Caribbean cuisine. It was, I listened to it on Audible as well as reading and I read it and it was so, it was amazing. So I'm just <laughs> so mentioning that to you. Thank right, you. okay. So let's get into some of the, the formal conversa uh, conversation and the questions. Uh, Jandela, we're gonna start with you. 
Um, throughout the book and the, you know, a main theme through the book is around visibility and black women's visibility is central. And in your essay, you talk really powerfully about some of those kind of negative consequences of hyper visibility for us as black women, um, from tokenism to fetishization. Can you explain some of those kind of complexities involved with our heightened visibility? Um, and particularly at this moment in time when, you know, many organizations are, you know, to be frank, co-opting black women's labor um, to, appear, to kind of really appear in, in kind of in step with this, this climate of um, performative anti-racism in, in some cases. Yeah, so I think um, definitely when we're talking about hypervisibility of black women, um, there's just the fact that women are objectified as a gender kind of essentially and then also black people are also object objectified as an ethnicity or as a race so these kind of um these kind of objectifications kind of really narrow and I feel like they're really kind of narrow and focused when you're a black woman and um I think there's something in the fact that um, I absolutely love this quote from Toni Morrison and I'm gonna not I'm gonna paraphrase it because you know what I mean I'm like all respect to uh, Miss Toni and I don't want to butcher her words but basically in um, The Bluest Eye um, she says something along the lines of no one paid attention to us so we paid attention to ourselves and I think that as black women we've really been paying attention to ourselves we've really kind of been um, amplifying each other we make each other look good so then other people are like, oh, there's something over there. Like, oh, I want to get involved or, oh, I want that kind of part of that sisterhood. So when you have people like masquerading as black women online, like I want to be a part of that kind of interior conversation. I want to be a part of that loving, um, affirmative community because I'm not finding it elsewhere in life. And um, it's kind of, um, yeah, it's really it's a bit disorientating because on one hand you've you've grown up as a black girl in like a white world and no one pays attention to you and now everyone's paying attention to you for weird reasons now people want to be you it's like what is going on and then obviously we've kind of like the recent resurgence of black lives matter and then people like oh okay we actually need to pay attention to black women so they kind of throw you into the spotlight and um expect you to kind of take on this extra labor so i've seen kind of black female act, um, academics online kind of talk about the fact that as well as their research work or as well as their doctoral work they're expected to all of a sudden like helm a university's diversity and inclusion kind of program and that's unfair because no one else has got that kind of like extra labor so there's this real like um it's almost like a catch-22 because on one hand, like for me, I work for an independent media publication, Black Ballad. As soon as these opportunities to kind of be visible and push kind of stuff about our lives, I want to take it. But at the same time, it comes with a lot of labour. It comes with um, a lot of scrutiny as well. Um, being a Black woman online, you're kind of you have to brace yourself for the trolls and the backlash. So it's, it is, it does feel like a catch 22 because how do we leverage this hyper visibility to the benefit of ourselves and our community, but also how do we protect ourselves? How do we protect our work, our time, our emotional health? Um, so it's really hard. It is really, really hard. It's so interesting, isn't it? Cause there's that whole kind of the, the unremuneration of that intellectual and emotional labor that goes with being a black woman in the world and so if we just think about how in your essay you talk really um quite in, in real detail about your you know your relationship with technology and and the internet um and I learned so much about through through about you through your essay so you know you describe um like you escaped in in into your computer um with this this kind of different persona and identity and as you developed your own kind of, you know, political and social consciousness where you embraced everything that it is to be black, you kind of just talk about this cultural capital that that, that bought you as, as an identity, um, crossing nations and, and continents. And, and especially given the time that we're in and thinking about the movements around Black Lives Matter and, and Me Too, and their embryonic ways in which they started through the internet. Can you kind of, walk us through a bit of that story for me because it was it's a really uh, compelling start to the essay 
Yeah, so um, to put it bluntly, I used to pretend to be a white girl online when I was a teenager. And that was just because I didn't think there was anything else to be, if that makes sense. Like as a 13 year old, I went to an all white school. Um, all of the, the people that I saw every day were generally white. I'll go online and I just assumed that everyone online was white as well, because this was back when, you know, we didn't have our pictures. We had like cute little animations or pixelated kind of representations of ourselves. So I kind of just thought, oh, wow, like at school, I'm this awkward, gangly, like unattractive black girl, like online, I can be the Barbie that I would like to be in real life. So I kind of escaped into this world pretending to be someone else. But um, over time, I guess part of it was maturity, but part of it was also kind of seeing the world for what it was. So the world of the internet actually opening up and realizing that no, like when I go on Bebo, I'm talking to other like black people in America or when I go on MySpace, I'm seeing loads of black people in London and Birmingham and Manchester and I'm meeting more people. And it was like, oh, okay, like there's, like there's a whole world out there that isn't white and it isn't kind of centered on whiteness. And then I really kind of lent into that and um, just embraced that kind of realness of who I was. And as you start to talk to people across different cities, across different countries, you realize that blackness has this, um, yeah, there's this like underlying cultural rhythm, which I, it's not contrived. I mean, we, I'm not a, I guess, a sociologist to really kind of like get down to the nitty gritty of how it develops. But when, whether you're talking to kind of like a black person in California or whether you're talking to a black person in Amsterdam, there's like a subtle kind of rhythm that kind of seems to carry our conversations that underpins our experiences as black people in a white Western world. And just from the rhythms of our music from different places to our language to the um to the way that we interact with our communities and our family and it was like a real awakening for me that I'm not alone. I'm just not alone <laughs> I'm not alone feeling like I'd been alone for so long just in terms of being in a white working class neighborhood going to a white middle class school and then um it also kind of coincided with me being old enough to choose what college I went to. So I went to a college where there was like a big like group of like black and Asian students. And it was that realization that while like, I'm not alone and um, we have this understanding of each other that even though I've grown up in this very white world, it's almost like, I don't wanna like use all these cliche terms or whatever, but it's almost like a language. There's a language that we speak, that we get and that we understand each other. So um, it was just really, really exciting. Thank you. I mean, I think that's a powerful point, you know, in terms of owning our identity, the language and the, the some of the, the real benefits that that access can, can give us in our, our discovery of who we are in the world. So, you know, it's a nice segue. Um, Paula, in your essay, you talk about that research that goes with the kind of commodification of self and that kind of personal branding, brand you. Um, which is often quite, quite embraced by and encouraged by social media in lots of ways. And it's that cultivation of ourselves um, in, in the image of ourselves for economic gain. And that's critically important to us as, as black women uh, in, in the hierarchies that we, we exist within this country. Can you talk about the, the kind of complexities of, of navigating that and how that speaks to the particular pressures of black women and, and what we face in the world? Um, I think that as black women and as black women within our particular generation, we are facing a completely new phenomenon. And I guess that's what I wanted to capture in the essay in that we are now, we have social clout and have platforms that aren't predicated on, um, that aren't controlled or, molded for us like we're able to build these social media accounts and you know on instagram twitter etc and we're able to actually hold weight so we're able to hold people to account so if someone does something that's anti-black we're able to chime in on twitter in a way that we haven't been able to do before um through these mediums so then when we become attractive to brands and organizations normally through having been outspoken about particular issues or building community projects or um, creating initiatives for ourselves and for the people that are coming after us it does make it 
where we do become attractive because you're seen as okay so you're an authentic influencer and I guess that's what I was trying to get at the what happens when you are now attractive and your work hasn't changed but you know there might be a sponsored post here or there might be you know a campaign there and does it how does it affect that work going forwards and how do we maintain authenticity whilst also very much having to need like having to pay bills or having to uh, yeah just you need income we do live under a capitalist society so I think I was trying to understand where we go from that and I think that's something that I've been struggling with in my own personal life as well you know you become more known for community-based things so now when it becomes very attractive and people want to work with you then is it possible to bridge that and just say but I'm still doing the work however I am getting a check here from xyz for something else um and I think it's a new thing that a lot of us are having to navigate now that we are simultaneously able to build spaces, but also now it's potentially quite lucrative. And is the idea, the politics of securing the bag, but I guess I was trying to ask at what cost and is there a possible cost to self? And does it mean that we have to chop and change bits of ourselves? Um, yeah, like I said, a lot of questions, very few answers. But the thing about it, what I thought was good, though, is actually, you know, being as honest about that, because that's one of the things that we, we have to be to be able to move everybody on in terms of everybody learning from that. So I just, what do you think about this? You know, there's, we know the default narrative out there is, you know, white male identity in terms of, um, you know, the gaze, if you like, and you talked about in your essay, I like that quote, black womanhood is in, um, even though we know that there's there's an exploitation of that. What there's There comes this responsibility, what you mentioned really clearly there, that it's almost like you're representing the whole of the black community when you're, you're talking, you know, and um, there isn't that sophisticated understanding. Well, I think it's a straightforward understanding that not all black people are alike, um, but there isn't, how do you, um, what do you think might help to change some of that narrative and um, freeing you from the responsibility of having to feel like you're speaking for all black people, but also how that looks to, to others? Do you... Yeah, I mean, I don't do that anymore. <laughs> um, I think in creating spaces for other black people, I'm very much dedicated to my communities and what my communities are asking of me, but also how they're holding me to account. Um, and I think what ties in with the essay is that I've definitely been held to account for some of the brand work that I've done in the past or some of the organizations that I've worked with, with people being like, did you know that they actually do X, Y, Z? Or did you know that, you know, this looks a bit dubious? And I think that's important to also be held to account. Um, but yeah, in terms of kind of your world being shaped by like gazes, I, I really don't, I don't really care about <laughs> white people. And I think that my, all of the work that I do is very much informed by what my community is asking of me. I really find that I don't, and I think also it's by virtue of being, not virtue, but privilege of being self-employed as well. Like I think there are fewer people that I'm answering to, and it means that I can very much pour myself into, I guess, what I hope is useful or contributing to some, like the landscape, the cultural landscape that we're all creating as young black, um, specifically young black women. Um, so I think that's where my priorities lie. Great, thank you. And uh, it's it's not hopeful, it is super useful and and more. So Cuba, um, Going on to your, your essay, which I found fascinating. I have to say I have a background in sport and physical activity. So for me, it was a it was, it was so compelling because you, you had so much in it. You had this personal journey of your relationship with food, your relationship with your, your cuisine. And at the same time, you kind of raised all of these complex 
interconnecting issues to do with social inequalities, health inequalities, um, class, um, racism, and everything that goes in between all of that. And, and the, the times that we find ourselves in now, uh, especially with COVID-19, a global pandemic, and the disproportionality impacts on us as black and brown and Asian people, what, what do you think that we have learned through how the ways in which uh, this has been racialized in terms of economic outcomes um, and, and, and the UK and the government's response to, to all of that? Um, yeah, it was really eerie actually <laughs> watching it all unfold um, because when I was writing it, it was like, October last year um, and I was putting myself in the mind frame of okay so this what was happening in 2011 kind of thing and what sort of public health approaches was the government taking towards things like obesity and what sort of coded language were they using and what was the media saying about black people and how lazy and fat they are basically so I just wanted to go and like look at look at that really deeply and, and what might happen or what it would look like if that sort of thing was to resurface which it does all the time but there's usually sort of one massive push and the pandemic was that push uh it was so quick it was it went from black people thinking that we we're immune <laughs> to covid and then to black people actually it's your fault because <laughs> so vitamin d or you're eating really bad food or you're just inherently unhealthy and you all have diabetes it was just like yeah. it was wild <laughs> to actually see it all happening in real time and then for boris johnson of all people to talk about the need for people to be less fat and to, to lose weight and and this strange language and worry as well about people being at home working from home putting on weight and I guess the push from the government to then punish those people as if they had a choice in the matter so sort of targeting deals on food <laughs> and stuff like that when people have less money than they've ever had sort of focusing on all the wrong things rather than actually looking at how they could solve things and make things better for people. And I think it just showed me that when there is an opportunity to scapegoat certain groups, it will either be BAME people or oh. black people. I know, BAME, like, please, can we not? Um, but <laughs> that, that's usually the coded sort of language behind that is, it's your fault. We all know that you're like this anyway. and if you die well whatever um and then also that compounded with black lives matter protests going on in june and then the government actively trying to withhold information about why black people were dying disproportionately dying from covid because they were afraid that there'd be a backlash was just that was insane to me i was just incensed i spent this whole summer being angry <laughs> and being like i wrote that how did I, I I don't I don't predict things very well I just it was just something that I had anticipated sort of happening um it was kind of mind-blowing <laughs> you, know, you got today. it spot on you got it spot on in so many ways I mean it's just that whole demonization of, of people with obesity was just kind of clearly a, a part of the narrative all the way throughout and so my next question was I mean I may, you may have already answered it but do you think there are you know, there's sufficient institutional and political will to understand and tackle some of these inequalities and blind spots. And I, I just want to kind of just, uh, from, from somebody who comes from a local government background as well, I know that there are people that are trying to tackle inequalities, because I, I know it, because I've, I've kind of been close to it. But we know how this needs, the way in which to tackle some of these issues are so interconnected that the, the, the leadership and the will and the buy-in is so critical in comparison to other issues. What, how do you think that is, how, how far away are we from that kind of buy-in that's needed to, to really start to, sh to shift and change some of the narratives and the, the kind of statistics around this? I think we're a long way off. I mean, a lot of the, the things, that, the issues that I brought up in my essay we're talking about years, well, quite a few years ago, and are still prevalent today, just in terms of the way that we talk about health, the way that we talk about obesity, food, racism. Um, they weren't being taken seriously then, and they're, they're certainly not being taken seriously now. We've had all these different reviews um, into racial inequality, all these different commissions, and MPs that seem to have been placed 
uh, to deny the existence of racism altogether um, in the government, which completely delegitimizes everything and is supposed to have the effect of of society generally thinking this is not something that needs to be taken seriously. This is a bugbear uh, that black people keep going on about because they've got a chip on their shoulder rather than people saying, no, there are all these in interconnected things that don't necessarily only affect black people. They affect the entirety of society. It just unfortunately for us, we <laughs> happen to be <laughs> the ones who bear the brunt of all of those inequalities or a great deal of them in different ways um, as well. So I think, I think the government's not approaching things uh, or taking things seriously at this point. We're having, uh, I think Sajid Javid, it was either today or yesterday, him sort of claiming that repeated claim of the left hating ethnic minorities who were Tories kind of thing. And that's the sort of narrative that is, is pushed forward so that you don't focus on the structural issues that are carrying on because the government is positioning these things as unimportant or inconsequential in the grand scheme of things and they are um I just yeah I'm hope I think people are beginning to see through what's happening just because the government's just failing <laughs> completely on on all levels I don't I'm not necessarily so optimistic that I believe that everyone is going to suddenly understand why racism and structural racism is important and needs to be tackled but I do hope that some of the efforts or lack of effort that has been put in to making things better will be challenged a lot more and recognised by people who aren't directly affected. And I've seen a little bit of that. So that's great. Right. I mean, that that kind of takes us on to this next point when we're kind of just going to open it up a little bit. So please feel free to kind of jump in. Uh, team, you know, what I'm like I'm a sportswoman, so I'm going to call you my team. Um, the Black Lives Matter movement and everything that we have been seeing and how it's been impacting us and, and through our screens in terms of the, what's been happening over in the US with the, the killing of, of George Floyd and, and other American citizens at the, the hands of the police and brutality uh, has seen these kind of new, new <laughs> renewed commitments from organizations and corporates and some of that performative perhaps and some of that may be genuine around diversity and inclusion um and you know some of those are are kind of ramping up some of the the, the real mom momentum and 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 uh, engagement of organizations that weren't engaged previously so what do you think it, it will take to create kind of greater racial equity for black people and especially for loud black girls in in today's climate and um you know are we seeing enough from those organizations. We know that the system of, of racism and how it structurally it exists within this country means that we're, if we're at the table, we may not even have the power to make any of the contributions that we need to. In the, in the book, Siana, Siana Bangora talks about that really powerfully in terms of the table and who built that table and, and what's that table made of. So Paula, what, what, what do you think about what's going on now with, with many organizations and how they're responding to the Black Lives Matter movement? Um, I think during that moment, it was very hard to be black. I think June was like a very diff like difficult time to be a black person. And I think seeing commitments from organizations and brands, for me personally, I'm very disillusioned. And I don't think that, I don't think that any, brand that was posting black squares or posting some sort of black models or whatever it was that they had on hand. Um, I don't, I think it was more of a very carefully curated PR response and realizing that a lot of brands were being called upon to share their statistics, to share, you know, how many black people they had working in their headquarters, all that kind of stuff. And I think the minute the, you know, we've hit July, August, I think it very much died down. And I guess I just, I don't really hold any stock in, sorry to be like a complete downer, um, but I don't really hold any stock well, in. This is a real conversation, Paula. There's no, there's no apologies here. This is unapologetically us being loud black girls. Okay, Debbie Downer, here she comes. Um, I just, yeah, I don't feel like there's, 
any stock that we can hold in brands and organizations where ultimately the goal is to make as much profit or bring in as much revenue as possible. And I think if I think it's been bleak beyond I think Black Lives Matter as well. I think watching what happened with the Labour Party and their treatment of black women and black politicians, I think there is it's shown us that more and more we have to divest from party politics and you know brands putting out campaigns therefore that is liberation I think that we have to look inwards and even more so than we are now so like the work that you know Black Ballad are doing for example like that kind of very intra-community work and it's specifically for and very targeted towards black women. Um, I think that's the kind of work that we end up will ultimately need to be supporting more because um, brands aren't gonna save us. Jandela, can I invite you to kind of give your perspectives around brands and corporates and their commitments, their jazzy slogans around EDI? Um. I think that they don't have the tools or the machinery to make lasting change because of just the way that they're set up. So my approach is if you really care about it, give money, resources to the people who can do the work. So there are people who are very active in their communities. There are people who are actually underground and involved. And I don't want to hear any more pledges I don't want to hear any more talk like just where's the money <laughs> we need money give money to the people who can do the work and I think that the biggest um barrier um specifically for like British um businesses British organizations British br brands is the fact that um there's the British sensibility of virtue signaling and wanting to be congratulated for doing the work, of wanting to be seen as the quote unquote white savior, as wanting to be seen as kind of, oh, look at me, I'm doing this really great thing. And that's not helpful because change will only be in effect when you don't get a cookie for doing the right thing, when it's just kind of the standard like modus operandi. But so I think that there's a very big barrier in our British psyche that will actually allow change to be lasting because as long as um, people aren't willing to completely step out the way and say to the people who like to black women, whoever, whatever marginalized identity it is, here's the space, here's the resources, here's the money, you do what you need to do. And I'm gonna step back and just let you, I'm not gonna try to take any credit. I'm not gonna try to get a photo up. I'm not gonna plaster you on my website so that I, so everyone can see how like, much of an ally I am until that attitude really sinks in we're not going to see change it's just going to be this constant like circus of oh my gosh something terrible has happened let's all virtue signal okay everything's died down let's get back to business and it's it's exhausting so um I think that's just like the ego needs to go and the money needs to show up and be given to the people who can do it because these things take money ultimately so yeah there's something really powerful about power within what you're saying because even when that does happen and, and those organizations might commission in the black woman or a disabled person to do the work when they're entering into a system that is in institutionally discriminatory institutionally racist they're often they're not given the power or they're not listened to in that space they're like even if you're in that space you're saying right we're going to do it like this and they're like, no, no, this is this is the structure in which you have to work. So that makes it even more problematic. Cuba, if I if we think if we take this conversation a bit deeper around, you know, writing, and we've all got those things in common here. And you know, that despite some several kind of high profile successes in, in the literary world, there's still a long way to go for black writers, undoubtedly, um, and black women in particular. So what do you think needs to change in the hiring and the commissioning? Um, of the so that our stories get to be told um a lot <laughs> I think initially there needs to already be a desire for things to change um not just because you want to save face you want to not look bad but because you already had that within you already that you already had that as a goal in your mind that there's something wrong with this industry whether it's the, the literary industry or it's, it's journalism or whatever if you already see that there's an issue and you have already put in some steps to change that, then that means you're on the right path. 
but that's not the case <laughs> in a lot of these industries. A lot of these people sort of would have achieved, seen that call to arms or would have taken the the, pro the protest as a call to arms and said, oh my God, we're going to look so bad if we don't put out a statement right now. What, what should I do? All? And then like get the one black person to deal with it all. So instead of doing that, I think what needs to happen is that there needs to be a fundamental shift in the way people think about what is valuable. Um, I, I've seen just just talking to other writers and generally speaking, like a lot of black writers, um, the idea of this being like a moment for black people. And it sort of started around the time of like the Windrush scandal as well. Sort of uh, a lot of uh, either publications or publishers sort of suddenly waking up and being like, oh, now I want to listen to black people because it's hot in the news right now. Um, that should never be the approach. It should be that these stories are worth telling and that they're interesting and that they make your content or your, your company or output generally 100 like 100 times better and not obviously not just from from black people but having as much of a of a mix of stories and ideas um and and not sort of using it just to bolster your own image i think is the way forward uh it's, it's going to take a while and, and then until we're in positions where we can affect change um it, it will take a lot longer which is why it's so important that there are Black-led organisations um, and for Black people as well, not necessarily geared towards general markets um, like Black Ballad, like there's Black Writers Guild as well that that sort of came together after the protests and and sort of pushed the publishing industry to really take stock of what it was doing, um, and in journalism as well. So what my approach to commissioning is generally. I, if you have something interesting to say and you have a good way of telling that story, I want to hear from you kind of thing. It's not, I think there's a thing that happens in these industries where there are a select group of people that are, that are chosen, I guess, um, and who are thought of as the ones that should be go-tos for everything, mm -hmm. where that doesn't necessarily need to be the case. I, I really believe in in helping new writers, and that doesn't necessarily mean they're young either. New writers, they might be new in the sense that they're not heard on the scene as much or people don't know their names. But I think championing people we haven't heard from is a really, really important thing to do. And looking at all the ways that we can do that in the best ways possible is, is sort of the way forward, I think. Yeah, definitely. And um, as we, at the end of 2020, where do we, draw hope for our futures as, as black women, you know? So the answer to the book on the front of the book is, is what next, um, you know, really building on Slay on Your Lane. But do you think that that question posed by Yomi and Elizabeth has, has been changed by the events of the year? What, what do you think for, for of, you know, what does it look like for black women's futures um, in, in this context, Jandela? Um, I think obviously the events of 2020 have kind of changed everything but at the same time I think as a black woman you're always kind of ready for something <laughs> like you're just always kind of to exist and to um, be able to I guess live to a certain to, in like relative comfort you always are kind of like braced for something to happen so while everything that's unfolded is undoubtedly unsettling it's shocking it's um confusing I think that um we are kind of prepared for disaster and I hate to say that but it's true like living in a white supremacy society we're prepared for disaster whether that's a personal disaster because um someone you know might have a a violent encounter with a police officer whether it's due to um just the in a, unequal health outcomes that we know plague our, like we're kind of ready for disaster on some level so i think that the question hasn't really been changed it's just that the um the context is just very different to what it was when i think a lot of us were writing that these essays but in essence i think from reading everyone else's contributions like like it's the same, like we're still in that same position. We're still looking towards the future. We're still examining our past. We're still trying to dissect the present. Like um, maybe the world looks a bit worse for wear, but we're still here and we're still gonna be here and we're still gonna do the work. So um, yeah, I don't, I mean, I'm, jo I'm joining Paula with the Debbie Downer vibe, but yeah. it's true. <laughs> there's something, there's something inspiring about that as well, because actually we, we do have the strength to do that. And Paula, I'll, I'll bring you in here because Actually, I want you to, to share what, what would your advice be to 
the new generation of loud black girls, you know, through the essays and through the work that you do, what, what would you be saying to them right now? Honestly, I don't know if I'd be giving them advice. I think I'd be asking for advice because I think that the black women coming after us have a fire. Like I, I know that we do as well, but you know, the younger people, if you think about how black people mobilized after George Floyd, Breonna Taylor's murder, all of these events of state sanctioned violence against black people and calls for abolition, defunding, or like, I ended up reading, you know, end of policing, et cetera, after being recommended it by younger black people, just being like, this is something that you should, you know, you should be cracking open. And I think that there's a, there's so much fire that is coming after us and building on the work that we're doing and the work that has come before us as well. And I think that's also really important. I think this, alongside us as writers and filmmakers etc there's also a lot of black women historians who are starting to come through as well um and i think alongside looking ahead to the future it's also ensuring that we don't forget about the work that's been done by the black women ahead of us yeah. because i think that a lot of us i think maybe i touched on it in the essay the idea of firstism as well and i think a lot of us feel like there's a pressure and urgency to create something so that you can be the founder of or you know the this is the first i mean we fell into it as well like you know the positioning of black girl fest like you know the first sex it doesn't need to be that especially if it's for this particular community and it also therefore erases what black women have done before us so i think alongside looking to the future it's also ensuring that we have the records and a tangible grip on what black women have done before us before we rush to create these new spaces as if they haven't already been done yeah, incredible in terms of legacy. That legacy piece is so important. And I just want to round up now and just talk about Black Joy, because within throughout this discussion, there have been those acts of resistance that I actually can see as Black Joy. But I want to ask you what you see and how you what Black Joy means to you, Cuba. Oh, wow. <laughs> what does it mean to me? Uh, black, I guess black joy means freedom uh, and exercising freedom whatever way you feel suits you. I don't like sort of prescribing a specific way that people should be joyful. So wonderful. Thank you. Jandela, what does black joy mean to you? Um, I think that um, one of the things that's really become clear to me is that black joy doesn't exist in a vacuum where all of these horrible things aren't going on it exists despite that and it exists in a way that kind of fortifies us for that so when looking at um, recent events like with the NSARS protests happening in Nigeria and I mean it was absolutely horrific I was emotionally drained for a few days but then seeing like the Nigerian youth on the ground start to like crack jokes make like they they found the light-heartedness to kind of bring into the situation and that's not to negate from the horrors that were happening but it was just bringing joy which kind of just fortified us there was obviously meme culture I love meme culture there were all these memes about the president <laughs> coming up about there were all these kind of like attacks on this very like rigid ageist kind of society that Nigeria can be and it was just funny so even amongst the horrors of the um violence and the kind of mobilizing of the Nigerian military there was just there was just pure joy because it was like we're alive we're here we're resisting and you know what the world is burning, but we can still laugh. And I think that's really important because we need to live, we need to exist. Thank you, Jandela. And finally to you, Paula, Black Joy. I think Jandela's like hit the nail on the head. I don't think Black Joy can exist in silo, especially considering that we live in a world that's predicated on our subjugation and our world is formed by anti-blackness. So I think that any joy that we find is ultimately still linked to our blackness and it's in spite of the horrors that we experience as black people globally. Um, so I think joy to us is, it's literally resistance and it's literally finding the humor in some of the bleakest situations possible because you we don't there's nothing else for us to do we have to keep it pushing and I think that's we find 
we're so resourceful and the way that we can spin even the most traumatic incidents into something that at least we can just poke fun at or laugh at or kiki about in some way um so i think joy is our resistance and it's our way of just just noting that this thing has happened and it, it i won't kill me and i have to keep i have to keep going Thank you so much. What a, a brilliant way to end our discussion. Short, sweet, tough, resistant, joyful, all of those words. It's been thought provoking. It's been nuanced. It's been informed. I've, it's been a pr privilege and an honour of mine to be in your company for sure. I don't take, say those things lightly. Trust me. <laughs> By Loud Black Girls, our community out there. This is a great book. It has some incredible essays in there and some incredible women. Please make sure that you support all of our panellists, Cuba, everything to do with Paula's work, everything to do with Jandela's work, go online, look at their work, look them up and support them. Make sure that you check out the RSA social media, the RSA events, um, and you know, look at their channels for the regular updates of upcoming events and everything that, that goes with joining the global fellowship changemaker community that is the RSA. But I'm going to end today with one of the editors, Yomi's words. We raise our voices and shout over stereotypes, misconceptions, and continued attempts to author our own stories so that we can finally be heard on our terms. Loud Black Girls. Thank you very much for tuning in, for listening. Thank you to this wonderful group of women who are amazing. Thank you to the RSA. Thank you to everybody watching. A good evening, a goodbye, a good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world today.